join uh, and speak to the webinar. So I think that um, we're ready now to start. Um, thank you very much indeed, everyone, for uh, joining. I'm going to close down my uh, welcome screen now, um, all being well. And we're going to welcome uh, Tim Smythe and Angus Atkinson from the Plymouth Marine Laboratory, who are going to talk respectively um, about uh, oceanography and plankton uh, in the year 2021. So thank you very much indeed, uh, both of you speakers, and uh, to all you attendees for turning up. And over to you, Tim. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Keith. Uh, let me just uh, start by sharing my slides. So just bear with me. And you should hopefully be able to see that in presentation mode. Is that all good? to people remote. Keith, is that, uh, can you see the screen there that I'm sharing? Yes, I can see the screen. You and just need to open the PowerPoint. Uh, I'll have opened the PowerPoint and I'm hopefully sharing in presentation mode. Uh, no, it's not in presentation mode. It's on your, on your computer screen. That's what I've got. Right. Yeah, I'm the same. Um, it's not in presentation mode yet, Tim. Always have this issue. <laughs> okay, let's start again. You would have thought after about two years that we'd be brilliant at doing this. Right, hopefully now you can see it. Indeed, uh, we can see that. Brilliant, thank you very much indeed. And thank you very much to the MBA for hosting uh, this uh, seminar for us. Um, so what I'd like to talk about today is uh, the, south, uh, the state of the Southwest Seas. Um, we've, we've called it oceanography, but actually it's more probably uh, the, the salient meteorology, which then drives uh, the oceanography. And the talk really will be centered around the observations of the Western Channel Observatory over the past 12 to let's call it 15 months, because I'd quite like to capture um, some of the uh, latest events that we've been seeing uh, since uh, the start of the new year. So I hopefully advance the slide. So what is the Western Channel Observatory? So to the, those of you who don't know what the Western Channel Observatory is, it's really a, a set of time series stations in the Western English Channel. Um, and the major uh, marine time series stations are highlighted in red. So that's station L4, which is about uh, four nautical miles due south of, of Rain Head, and then station E1, which, uh, go, uh, which is about 20 nautical miles uh, off uh, Rain Head. And then if you think of how, about how far the Edison is away from Plymouth, uh, pretty much the Edison Reef bisects um, L4 and E1. L4 is in around about uh, 50 metres deep uh, water and station E1 in about 80 metres deep water. L4 is much more coastal in its nature and E1 is much more sort of open shelf uh, in its um, hydrography. Um, we've also got several other uh, parts of the Western Channel Observatory. So we've got an atmospheric uh, time series station. We started in about 2014, uh, really looking at the atmospheric chemistry of what's going on. So that's the old Trinity House or the Trinity House hut, um, which if uh, you walk around the coast, you'll, you'll know it very well. Uh, and we've been taking measurements there for about the last seven or eight years. Um, the pelagic time series I've already mentioned, so we take uh, water samples uh, and CTD with depth at uh, the, the two uh, marine time series stations. So there's a, an image on a very 
calm day of the uh, CTD rosette going over the um, aft end of the of the quest. And then we've got some uh, benthic uh, time series stations, again at L4, one uh, just off Rame Head, and then one at Corsand and one at Jenny Cliff. So these are really what uh, comprise the, the, the major parts of the time series of the Western Channel Observatory. So let's dive straight in as to uh, what the regional picture is going to be. Um, I've taken uh, a lot of this data or all of this data from uh, the UK Met Office. UK Met Office every season produce this really great um, sort of synthesis in pictures of what's uh, what our weather has been like. And I think it's very useful to look at these images. So just to give you a bit of orientation here on the left, We've got the mean temperature. So, so the next five slides are going to be very similar. So we've got the mean temperature here on the left, the mean or, or the, the, the rainfall amount in, uh, in the middle, and then we've got this sunshine duration. Now, the reason I've chosen these parameters is because for the hydrography of the Western English Channel, these things are the things which will drive it. So, um, you know, how anomalously warm it's been will be driven by the meteorology, the amount of uh, fluvial uh, outflow you get from the Tamar will be driven by how much rainfall we've had, and then sort of the sunshine duration will set the, 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 the short wave incoming radiation that we get, which will drive things like stratification, particularly in the early part of the season. So what we can see here in, in the mean temperature, and this is against the 1981 to 2010 um, anomaly, um, and what you can see is that pretty much the winter of 2021, so that means the winter from December 2020 through to February 2021, was pretty nondescript over much of the UK, um, so pretty average um, over that period. In terms of the amount of rainfall we had, actually it was pretty wet um, that, that, uh, that winter, so the winter before last, um, sort of upwards of 110 to 130% of the average rainfall that you get. And then as you'd imagine with the amount of rainfall you get, uh, it was particularly notably uh, dull in terms of the amount of sunshine that we got. So the, the, the seasonal average uh, really sort of glosses over or, or, or smears out a lot of the, uh, of the variability that you get. So what we've got here, this is the mean temperature for winter 2021 with the average shown here in the dashed line. And this, this mean here is the mean for 20, uh, sorry, 1981 to 2010, so the 30 year period. Now it's important to note here that as we go through into the following uh, year, this will change to the 1991 to 2020 anomaly, but this at the moment is uh, for that period. Now, you can actually see here, this, this highlights the, this, this, in, uh, this interesting uh, period here that you've actually got values greater than uh, the maximum for uh, the 20, 1981 to 2010 max in around February. So what we had here um, was a period that was warmer than, than, than the envelope for 1981 to 2010. And you, what you can see is that the, there were periods of, of colder weather. So sort of the later part of December and into January last year was, was, was notably colder. And then this period here that we see in uh, sort of mid-February, we, we, we went from pretty much the coldest that had been observed in the period all the way up to uh, sort of almost the warmest. So over a period of about a week, there was a notable uh, change in the weather, uh, which then set the, the, the scene for the rest of the, of the winter here. So although it was a very average winter, there, there was a lot of variability in it um, in terms of the temperature. And then let's move on into spring. Um, actually, springs over the last few years um, have been very similar to this, that it's been pretty dry, but actually quite cold. Um, and you can see uh, that over large swathes of uh, the United Kingdom, that the temperature was almost you know, approaching uh, one degree below uh, average, almost uh, one and a half degrees in some places of the Southeast. Um, the rainfall itself, it was, it was relatively, average in our location but if you just go down to the west of Cornwall uh, it was pretty dry so I, I suppose if we were, we were going to describe uh, spring last year it was cold and 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 dry-ish and then we seem to have uh, sort of more sunshine 
uh, than the average. In terms of what that looked like in terms of the anomaly, now what happens here is that uh, the, the Met Office has kindly added a, a few extra plots here. So the the average is uh, the, the the blue. Uh, sorry, is the is the is the black line here. What we actually had is in the blue. So you can see that there was a very brief period in in March and early April that was that was almost as warm as it is as, as it's got. But then you got this flip-flop right back down to in early April last year when we had a, a, a notably cold period. And you can see these, you know, there's probably about three notably cold periods in, in, uh, in spring last year, and maybe a, a little bit of, of warmth and cheer um, in this uh, sort of latter part of, of March. Let's go and look at the summer. Again, summer pretty unnotable in our region, uh, so maybe a little bit warmer than average uh, for, against the 81 to 2010 anomaly. It wasn't particularly wet or it wasn't particularly dry um, in our region um, and pretty average in terms of, of uh, in terms of sunshine. But then, you know, again, the detail is very interesting to look at. You can see this uh, notable possible heat wave that we had in sort of mid to end of July. Uh, but then you can almost set your watch by when the schools broke up. This is this is pretty much around this period that there was again this sudden flip down to, um, you know, colder than average, probably wetter than average uh, period. So we'll talk about that in a little bit um, in terms of the storms that we saw this year or last year. And then in terms of the autumn, again, um, this is mirroring uh, some of the trends that we're seeing. So we, we, found, we find that we've got relatively cold springs, but actually what we're getting are relatively uh, warm autumns. And, and last year, last autumn was no, uh, no different. We were getting somewhere between half and one degree above the anomaly. Um, it was not particularly wet or not particularly dry. So probably about average rainfall and uh, an and average in terms of the uh, insulation. And in terms of the time series, again, you can see that this warmth that we got in the autumn was, uh, you can see that most of the trace here is well above the, uh, the average. In fact, some of the um, warmest that have, have been recorded in the period, um, particularly in early September, and late September, you were getting these, these warm periods. And it wasn't really until the very end of uh, November, and this is when Storm Arwen came through, that we were getting uh, anything approaching weather that you describe as cold. And then finally, uh, let's talk about uh, the winter that we've just had. So this is two things to note here. This is winter 2021-22, uh, so December 2021 to February 2022. And you can see now that we've shifted our climatological window. So the climatological window now has shifted to 1991 to 2020. Um, and you can see that the, the winter as a whole uh, was warmer than average and pretty uniformly uh, warmer than average, uh, was pretty much drier, uh, somewhere between 70 and 90% of average rainfall this winter. But uh, interestingly was was pretty much duller than average as well so you get um, these dull um, down in the in the west of Cornwall there um, in terms of the temperature notable warmth I suppose around New Year I remember the the, the headlines in the newspapers was this was the warmest ever start to a year um, and this was borne out in the record here um, so two no notable uh, warm periods one sort of in early uh, to mid-December and then this this period in uh, late December early January was particularly warm you're looking at sort of maybe four or five degrees uh, above the average and that's the central England temperature so obviously there'll be some uh, regional variability around that so enough about sort of the climatology and and the averages around that what does this do in terms of the surface ocean uh, meteorology so what I'm looking at here are uh, the, the, the wind direction statistics. So this is for the previous winter. So this is winter 2020 to 21. And this is uh, this plot here is called a windrose diagram. And what it attempts to capture is how dominant wind is from a particular direction. So let's look here. So, so the most dominant wind direction 
uh, in the winter of 2020 to 21 was something like a west northwesterly. So we're getting up to maybe about 15% of the winds were from that direction. And then you can see that the, the color gives you how, um, uh, how strong the wind was. So, so basically our strongest winds uh, from winter, that winter briefly uh, were sort of on the, the, the in west southwesterly direction and up to maybe about 50 to 55 knots. So it actually wasn't a particular uh, windy uh, winter 2020 to 2021. There were occasional gales, but not sustained. So if you remember um, February, in 2020 was actually the windiest February on record. We didn't have anything like that uh, in, uh, in last winter or the winter before last. Then going into spring 2021, um, then you can see there, there's been a real shift in the wind direction. Um, so what we find here is that this, there is a sizable easterly or east southeasterly component here. This is really um, striking, um, not particularly strong, um, so we're only getting wind uh, uh, wind speeds up to maybe about 30 knots and, and for a very brief period of time. But this could um, really this really shows why there was quite a cold um, April uh, last year was because of this direction uh, of the wind. And then, um, you, you know, we do still have a westerly component and this is this is stronger. Um, so we're getting up to maybe 35, 40 knots in some of these um, instances here. Then going through into summer, as you'd expect, the summer is uh, much calmer, much less in the way of gales. Pretty much, um, again, there's a dominance of the westerly uh, wind type, uh, but very light winds uh, throughout, uh, light and variable winds, I would say, is the best way of describing uh, summer 2021. And then there's a, a very much a mixed wind direction in autumn 2021. And I'd just like to draw your attention to this, uh, that the strongest winds in this period, unusually, where it was a north-northwesterly. So I'm, I'm guessing this is the fingerprint of um, Storm Armand. We'll talk a little bit about that one in a moment. Uh, very uh, brief wind, uh, strong winds from that direction. But again, a pretty mixed picture in terms of the wind uh, direction. So um, I'll take you through the named storms of uh, 2021 uh, and into early 2022, because it actually starts getting a bit more interesting in 2022. Um, so these are the named storms by the UK and Ireland uh, Met Office. Um, the UK and Ireland Met Office uh, started naming storms, I think, in about 2015. Um, but then all the other Met agencies in Europe decided that this was a really good idea. And then that really made things very confusing uh, in terms of following uh, storm naming. Um, so I've highlighted one down here, which, which could be important. So uh, the first named storm of uh, that uh, or, or of 2021 was Christoph. So that would have been the third one in the, in the, in the series. So Christoph was between the 19th to the 22nd of January. Um, Darcy, there was a, a forecast to be apocalyptic snowfall, but that actually never rocked up. I think it was a little bit snowy in the, in the east of the country and, and into the near continent. And then this one's quite interesting. So Storm Evert, um, this is unusual, but it wasn't exceptional in terms of a summer storm, but you can see how late in the season, there wasn't anything in terms of named storms after the 8th of February, and there wasn't one until 30th of July. Um, and actually that's almost the very end of the year. So the, the, the st they start naming the storms in about the September. Storm Arwen, this, so they restarted the alphabet again. So um, Arwen was particularly noticeable. There was a, a red uh, weather warning for the northeast of uh, Scotland and England. Um, this was one of the most damaging uh, storms for a decade. There was quite a bit of snow associated with the tail end of it. Um, and there was quite a bit of damage done to infrastructure, power lines, etc., in the northeast of England that took a, a few weeks to really sort out. Um, then there was Storm Barra in, on the 7th to the 8th of December. This is worst in, in the Republic of Ireland. Um, and then this is where it gets confusing. The, the, the Danish uh, Met uh, Service named this storm Malik, uh, which came through on the 29th of January. Uh, Corrie, which hit us more on the 30th to the 31st. And then there, there was this trinity of really 
fairly severe storms, particularly Eunice was a was a was a notable storm, probably the worst for about 30 years, probably since the Burns night storm of 1990, um, which uh, we had a red weather warning for down here, if you remember rightly, and the highest wind gust um, was at the needles uh, of 122 miles an hour. I'll, I'll show you some of the observations we got and then pretty much on the hot hot. Uh, hot on the heels of Eunice, we had uh, Storm Franklin. So what did this look like in terms of the, the wind speeds that we uh, measured at, at Rame Head? Um, so you can see the named storms here. This is Christoph in C, uh, Darcy in D, uh, Evert. So this was this unusual. So we're here through into, uh, into August or late uh, July, early August. This is the storm Evert. So wind gusts up to about 55 knots. Um, so certainly enough to blow a tent away. Uh, and then Storm Arwin, which didn't affect us quite so badly down here in the southwest, and Storm Barra. And then in terms of what has happened during 2022, we can see this, this trinity of storms. I've, I've changed the scale here. So this is up, up and over 80 knots. So sustained winds of over 60 knots is, is hurricane force on the Beaufort scale. Um, so you can see that certainly Eunice uh, gave us sustained winds over, over hurricane force uh, for a brief period. Um, so uh, that's to note. the other thing to note is really that the that there are uh, that only really th this um, storm Corrie didn't really um, hit us very much at all down here in the southwest. And thanks to Yanni Pewter for this this plot here. This these are the data from Storm Eunice for the 18th, uh, so Friday the 18th of February, going through from midnight to uh, to 12 o'clock, uh, which is when the storm had already passed. And you can see this is this is wind speed in meters per second now. So we'll have to do a very quick mental bit of mental arithmetic. And the uh, the highest wind gusts that we um, recorded at uh, Penley Point was 44 meters per second at half past eight in the morning, which was actually when uh, most of the damage was done in this in this storm. It was around, so that's around about 86 knots or 98 miles per hour. So we're still about 20 miles per hour um, less than what was uh, recorded at the needles. But you can see that pretty much the storm was, was enveloped in over a period of about two hours before then uh, the wind dropped very noticeably away between 10, 10 o'clock in the morning and, and, and midday. But even uh, this is still uh, gale force. So, you know, it was pretty, pretty sustained uh, winds for around about 12 hours or so. And then in terms of what happened to uh, the wave heights. So this is what the you know, the impact, the noticeable impact of these storms on, on the wave height. So again, this is uh, January 2021. This is April, July, October, and uh, through to January 2022. So this is last year, looking at the wave heights. A storm threshold is set at, at Lou as a significant wave height over uh, something like 3.75 metres. So you can actually see that, that a lot of these storms, these name storms, didn't really have a huge impact in terms of the of how uh, how large the waves were. In actual fact, it's probably some of the sort of the more deep um, ocean swells that are giving us the, the highest wind, uh, the highest waves. Uh, so up to about five meters here in in May 2021, um, and you can see that uh, you know that, that although. They're not named. There are some uh, interesting events that happen earlier in the period, and then this is the the trinity of storms that came through uh, in uh, in in February. So this is Storm Dudley, uh, Eunice. So we got maybe wind, uh, wave heights over five and a half meters uh, in Lou Bay before it dropped away very very quickly. This is interesting to note. I think you know these deep ocean swells that we're getting uh, coming through and being picked up by the Lou Bay. Uh, boy, but no name storms associated with them. So what did that then uh, mean for the hydrography at L4 and E1? So uh, this, this here are the, uh, the, this is the vertical profile uh, that we measure um, with the Quest. So this is uh, depth, so zero down to about 50 metres uh, at L4. And uh, things to note, uh, this is the period of stratification. So stratification was fairly late in starting. Uh, in in 2021, uh, sort of uh, started in a early May and didn't really get going properly until June. 
uh, you can see the notable uh, warm period here in terms of uh, the higher temperatures. So temperatures above uh, 17 and a half, 18 degrees uh, in the surface layer. And you can see this very uh, marked stratification. So it's about 17 and a half degrees at the surface, about 14, 15 degrees uh, lower down, about 40, 50 meters down in the water column. And then stratification itself broke down in probably uh, late September. Um, the data from the latter period, we, we thank the, the AMBA sepia for coming to our rescue. So we had real engine problems with the Quest in that time. So we've got a brand new engine on Quest, um, but this is uh, data taken by uh, the, the sepia. And you can also see in the salinity signature, um, this is very typical of what we'd see in the winter time. So what we see is when, when it rains uh, a lot and there's a, this, um, this, uh, heavy rainfall that then flushes down through the Tamar, you see uh, these lenses of uh, much fresher water. So fresher water, we mean sort of about half to maybe a whole uh, salinity unit uh, lower than you'd expect. And we saw that sort of in, in January and through into February. And then sort of again, we saw that in, in November. And then there was a, a, a late spring boom last year. So it was sort of into the middle or uh, the end of, of April before anything started going. Um, but then in terms of uh, the summer and the autumn blooms, there would seem to be a couple of episodes of, um, uh, of summer and autumn blooms <coughs> here in the record. Sorry, I should have pointed out this is fluorescence. Um, so that's a proxy for uh, the chlorophyll concentration. And this is oxygen here, so you can see sort of how oxygen and fluorescence uh, relate to one another here because of the phytoplankton activity. And then in terms of uh, what this uh, looked like in terms of the anomalies, so what we've done here is this is the surface temperature anomaly in the top left, and then the 50 meter temperature anomaly here in the bottom right. Um, and then you can see every weekly sample uh, that we made during 2021 and how that sits against the, the average. So this is the, av the running uh, monthly average uh, as you go through the year. So generally we'd expect the coldest time of year is about now, um, sort of early March, then we get temperatures at L4 typically down to about uh, sort of just, uh, just under nine degrees and then up in the surface layer up to about 16 degrees in the summer. And then you can see what happened in 2021. Again, you can see this uh, colder uh, spring period. And it's not just at the surface. You can see that cold spring weather um, sort of all the way down to, to 50 meters down in the water column. So maybe about half a degree at 50 meters, maybe a whole degree, maybe two degrees colder than average uh, in 2021 spring. And then you can see this July warmth. What happens, the, the water column responds pretty quickly or, or the, the surface of the water column responds very quickly to any uh, warmth. And you can see that here in the surface. And then uh, you can see then the stratification breakdown, which is then when the top of the water column and the bottom of the water column are the same temperature. Uh, what does that look, what does it look like in terms of uh, salinity? Well, again, you can see these pulses of colder, uh, sorry, of uh, less saline, fresher water at the surface here, these lenses and how this looks like in terms of uh, anomalies. And then you can see this drift downwards in terms of the, uh, the average salinity over the last uh, year. So we've got progressively fresher. Uh, we look, need to look into mechanisms of why that's the case at the moment. Um, and then uh, let's look at E1. So E1's got a much longer temperature uh, and salinity time series, one of the longest time series in the world. Um, maintained by MBA and PML. Um, so this goes back to 1903. So you can see uh, the beginning of the time series here with the breaks for the world wars uh, and the uh, anomalies. So you can see that there's this period of, of, of warming over the last maybe 35, 40 years now. And what you can see in the series again for, uh, for E1, you can see this, this July warmth uh, and you can again see uh, the stratification breakdown. We only visit E1 typically in the summer every fortnight or so, and even less frequently, maybe once a month or so in the in the winter time. And again, this this shows that there's this general downward uh, salinity uh, drift at the moment. But you know, there's there's no reason to to believe that this is a, a long term trend. 
And then finally, uh, just finish up with the, what the nutrients have been doing at uh, L4 over the past year. So thanks to, to Mount Woodward and uh, Carolyn Harris for these data. Um, so what, what we're showing here is the, the nitrate, the surface nitrate at L4 and the surface uh, phosphate. So these are key inorganic nutrients um, uh, for, uh, for the ecosystem. And what you can see is the red dots are your average uh, levels of uh, nitrate and phosphate for each month. And then the actual measurements that we took in 2021 uh, are this uh, the solid line here. And you can see that last winter, there was probably about, I don't know, two, two to, to four uh, micromolar of nitrate more than you'd uh, than you expect on average. Uh, and then you can see during the summer, what happens is here is that the, the, the phytoplankton basically uh, finish up all the all the nitrate in the surface. So that's why the bloom crashes after, just after the spring bloom in the surface, uh, because it's, it's, it's nitrate limited. Phosphate never uh, becomes uh, limited at L4, um, but obviously there's a, there is a seasonal cycle. Um, so we generally would measure around about 0 0.5, 0 0.6 uh, micromolar um, in the winter time and, and sort of down to about just over or just about measurable um, in the surface in the summertime. So on that note, I will stop my presentation and I think that's all I've got. Yep, that's all I've got. So I shall stop sharing there and hand back over to you, Keith. Thank you very much indeed, Tim. All fascinating stuff, um, especially the comparisons over the years. Um, I've only got one bit of chat that I've picked up, um, and that's, uh, I'm looking for it now. Sorry, I'm not able to shine that up. Uh, oh, it's from um, your Johnson isn't 44 miles per second hurricane force. Yes, so I, th I believe that that's 44 meters per second. 44 so meters, not miles, yes, yes. meters. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so uh, yeah, well, it's all these, these units around. Um, thank you for that question, Bro. Uh, so uh, 65 or 60 to 65 knots sustained is, is hurricane force, Beaufort scale 12. Um, 44 meters per second, I think we put there was, um, I can't remember how many uh, how many knots it was. Was it 98 knots or 88 knots, something like that? So it's well over hurricane force, uh, but that's just the gust. So we need to be careful when we look at these things. The really damaging thing uh, to note is actually when you've got a wind speed of 80 or 80 knots, it's twice. It gives you twice the amount of force as one that's of 60 uh, knots. So just by increasing that amount, that's what does the real damage. Um, so that's that was just something that I, I, I picked up on um, during that particular storm. Uh, thank you very much indeed again, Tim. Um, participants, if you have got uh, questions, uh, best to put them in the Q&A, um, but I'm monitoring both Q&A and chat. And of course, if you put a question in Q&A and somebody else can answer it, you know, do answer it. Uh, otherwise, I'll pass them on to the uh, panellists. Um, so, Thank you, Tim. Uh, we're now ready to move on to Angus Atkinson to uh, talk about plankton uh, during 2021. So over to you, Angus. Okay, thanks very much, Keith. I'll just share my screen now. Right, can everybody see the, um, the screen in presenter mode? That all looks fine. That's good, right. Um, so, um, I'll just go back to the beginning. I don't know how it got to there. So you've had a sneak preview, but um, this is a joint presentation. I'm going to be sharing it um, with Jeanette Sanders, who's going to present four slides in the middle of this presentation on the Southwest Jellyfish Survey. But before I start, I just want to thank colleagues at PML for supplying large amounts of time series data um, on the plankton, and also from some of the Southwest Marine Ecosystems organizers, as well as um, basically everybody who supplied plankton records for last year. So the structure of the talk, I'm going to um, present half a dozen slides just to introduce um, West Country plankton and plankton food chains. Then the main part is the 
um, observations for last year and placing them into the longer term context of time trends um, for over the last 30 years or so. So um, this is um, a slide I showed um, actually last year and it um, sets the L4 and E1 sites that Tim has just been talking about, sets them into a sort of wider scale context and that's a um, a heat map of surface temperatures from um, satellite records. So the warm yellows and oranges are the um, warm stratified um, surface water that heats up in the summer and it um, is insulated from the um, waters underneath and it runs out of nutrients and that's separated from um, more tidally mixed areas, often inshore, um, which are those blues and purples, um, which are um, cooler water, more nutrient um, rich. Um, so um, there's quite a big um, diversity of habitats in the West Country. And the classic sort of um, plankton food chain that you get in a textbook is where the phytoplankton um, which I've illustrated here by diatoms, the primary producers, are eaten by the zooplankton, and I've illustrated them by um, Calanus helgolandicus, one of the biomass dominant large zooplankton. And they're in turn eaten by um, planktivorous fish, such as herring and sprat and um, pilchard, um, or by the larvae of um, demersal fish. So that's the sort of classic textbook picture of um, the food chain, which I want to keep in your head because I'm going to um, return to it later in the presentation. So um, this is actually a biomass breakdown of all of the plankton that we sample at the L4 site. Um, and I've ranked these sort of groups, we call them functional groups um, or um, broad taxa. I've ranked them from the largest at the top, the fish larvae and the eggs of fish through the jellies um, various um, plankton right down to heterotrophic bi um, bacteria about a micron long. So if you, um, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but I um, just described this classical um, food chain, the diatoms, um, they're actually quite a minor proportion of the total biomass. In turn, the large copepods, for example, the calanus, are a minor minor proportion, as are the fish larvae. So a lot of the plankton that you see um, are um, right up this top end and they're a tiny proportion of the biomass. Most of them you need either a microscope um, to identify or they're even too small for a microscope, you need a flow cytometer. Um, I've colour coded um, the basic sort of um, trophic levels um, so that you can see the various phytoplankton, which are um, coded in green, the more um, autotrophic um, taxa, for example, the diatoms and cyanobacteria, the synecococcus, dark greens, um, going to the more mixotrophic um, types, which are the paler colours. So I think the other thing to say about this um, slide is that the units of biomass are actually milligrams of carbon per meter cube. So they're tiny amounts per cubic meters of water. You're only getting um, a couple of milligrams of zooplankton feeding the rest of the food chain. So that seems to be a little bit of a conundrum because um, we know that there's quite big stock of fish um, in um, the West Country. These are the CFAS cruisers. They repeat them every autumn. Um, and this is acoustic and net survey um, biomasses of some of the fish um, in the pelagic. And these numbers, um, you know, I haven't put a scale on them, but the actual um, magnitude of the stocks of fish in the West Country um, was brought home to me because I grew up in, um, um, in the West Country in the 1970s. And this is a picture of my um, father's trawler coming home laden into Mill Bay docks landing 140 tonnes of mackerel that they just caught in one night. And it's um, only by going out on um, this trawler that I could actually see with my own eyes what a productive food web it was. So um, we've got a, a bit of a sort of conundrum because we've got tiny amounts of carbon in the, um, in the biomass of the um, the concentration of the plankton is very, very small. Um, but the answer is the habitat volume is enormous. If you add it up, um, 
I've just scaled up with this calculation 75,000 kilometers squared of the English Channel and the habitat um, extends down to several tens of meters for the plankton in the productive zone. So if you add all that up at any one time there is a quarter of a million tons of plankton carbon in the English Channel. And to put a sort of um, human um, sort of scale on that, it's um, equ roughly equivalent to the um, CO2 emissions of the whole of the UK in just one day. So you've got to remember that the, the turnover of this plankton is um, uh, roughly a day, uh, roughly something like a day. So it's putting a sort of human value on it. And there's um, a lot of interest at the moment in um, sort of describing ecosystem services and blue carbon and natural capital and a lot of emphasis on them is on things like mangroves and um, seagrass beds and kelp beds but the point is about the plankton it's very dilute but the habitat volume um, really adds up so it's a very large flux of carbon that we're talking about. So that bit of a background um, to say um, why the plankton are um, worth studying in relation to climate change, how are these fluxes changing. So I'm now going to go straight in with the observations in 2020, um, 2021. And these were compiled, um, thanks to Paul Naylor for um, compiling observations that were sent in for the Southwest Marine Ecosystems. I'm not going to um, read these off. I've just selected here um, a, a couple of them um, that are um, running through the year. But I think the, the thing to note is that there wasn't actually um, a remarkable um, incidence of, of any of the particular um, plankton species. We're often getting these reports of um, Noctiluca, um, sea sparkle, or some of the gelatinous sea plankton, or, or um, some of the um, Portuguese man of war, or by the wind sailors um, after the storms. So there's nothing really remarkable here. Um, there was rather um, more compass jellyfish than is normal. Um, but it wasn't a remarkable year. Likewise for the L4 plankton, um, Claire Widdicombe has described um, in the top um, paragraph here, um, a fairly typical succession of phaeocystis in the May, um, and then giving way to blooms of dinoflagellates um, in the summer and autumn. Um, there was a new um, toxic species. This is a dinoflagellate um, that she recorded in February. Likewise for the zooplankton, a few records, um, but nothing really stand out. Um, I should mention anchovy eggs found in the live samples um, in the summer. That's continuation of a recent trend, possibly related to the um, warmer summer temperatures. So I'll stop there and just hand over um, if Jeanette, um, if you're around, do you want to talk about the Southwest Jellyfish Survey? Oh, we might need to open Jeanette's microphone. Jeanette, if you're there, could you unmute and I'll let you talk over these slides. You'll do a far better job of it than me, probably. Um, I'm, I'm looking down the list for uh, uh, Jeanette Saunders. Yes, I've put allowed to talk. So Jeanette, you should be able to use your microphone. Can you hear me now? Yes, indeed. Excellent. <laughs> thank you for unmuting me. And thank you, Angus, for inviting me to talk. Um, so in 2018, we were doing a lot of outreach and people were asking us about unusual jellyfish that they were seeing. And these people were all people who were had a close association with the coast. So they were no strangers to jellyfish. Um, and we didn't have any answers for them. So. We went out and did some surveys and we also launched a jellyfish survey and we created some ID cards with what we thought were the most likely species they would see. Um, so this is this slide shows the ones that we thought at the time were going to be most common. Um, and if we just go to the next slide, then it will show you the other side. Um, so Angus, could you, thank you. Um, 
so this, these are the other ones that are less commonly seen and you'll probably notice that they're not all jellyfish. Um, one of the problems we had was that we didn't really know what unusual things people had seen. So we didn't want to just restrict it to true jellyfish. Um, and this is the sheet we came up with. It's not perfect. Um, there are some really good ones out there, but they tended to have a broader geographic distribution or they stuck to the true jellyfish. Um, so we use these and our own surveys to collect data. So if Angus wants to go to the next slide, we'll go straight to the data, um, which I've tried to summarize here as best I can. So across the top, you've got the years of data that we've collected from January 2019 up to December 2021. And down the side, you've got the species. And we've also tried to sort of split it broadly into areas of the coast. So North Devon, around North Cornwall, South Devon um, and South Cornwall. And then you've got little coloured squares. Um, so the colours reflect the maximum number of individuals that were reported by any one sighting in that month. So they don't, we didn't add up all of the sightings. We just said, well, what was the highest number in any one event in that month? Um, so the light grey would have been up to five sightings. Um, the purple would be anywhere between six and 50, and the black is where more than 50 individuals were reported. If we go down them, the barrel jellyfish were quite interesting because anyone who was around the coast in 2019 would have seen the, the barrel jellyfish. They were everywhere, they were washing up everywhere. Um, but we haven't really seen that since in the same numbers. We have had anecdotal reports from local fishermen saying that they're still offshore in large numbers. And one person who trawls Falmouth Bay, so he's been trawling there for 40 years, said that in the last 10 years, out of those 10 years, he has trawled up these mature barrel jellyfish by the ton in November for four years. So that, that was quite interesting, but it doesn't really tell us much else about where they go. The blue, the compass and the moon jellyfish have pretty much the same patterns across all the coasts. Um, there's a little bit of variation. The thing to say about the blue is that, although I've called it blue, we really don't know whether they're blue or lion's mane jellyfish because the juveniles are almost impossible for us to distinguish. However, we haven't had any verified reportings of adult lion's mane jellyfish around our coast in our data set, but we have had adult blues. So it's most likely they're blues, but we can't be definite about that. Um, the crystal jellyfish is really interesting. It's not a true jellyfish, it's a hydrozoan. Um, it's really elegant. And if you're lucky enough to see them in the water, they, they sometimes flash fluorescent green, which is where the original um, green fluorescent protein that's used in microscopy came from. Um, if you look in UK data sets for the last 20 years, they're very rarely reported. But if you go back to the 1950s and Russell, you'll find that they were regarded as being fairly widespread. It's almost certainly at least two species, possibly more, that we're re reporting. Um, and we didn't have many in 2019, but we certainly had a lot this year and in 2021. Sorry, 20, 2020. Um, the Portuguese man of war and the by the wind sailor are also not um, true jellyfish. And if you were to superimpose large storms on here, you'd see that they pretty much fit the pattern of washing up on the shores after the large storms. Um, and in 2022, they've already been reported on every coast in the Southwest region. And following the recent easterly winds, they've also been reported in areas like Torbay where they don't normally wash up. Um, I personally think the, the tinafores are really interesting. These are the sea gooseberries and cone jellies. Um, we had almost no uh, reportings until 2020 but in 2021 they have been reported pretty much everywhere apart from North Cornwall so prior to that the reportings we had were really um, individual mass strandings but in 2021 people have been reporting them um, 
just looking in the water from harbour walls, swimming, diving, and there've been lots of them in the water actively amongst other groups of jellyfish. Um, <clears throat> the one that's missing from here that is on our ID card as a commonly expected species is the purple or mauve stinger, Pelagia noctiluca. Um, although we had a few reports of this, when we looked into them, they were definitely misidentifications and they were actually blue jellyfish. But there are reliable historic records of large mass strandings of, of this species, particularly of, in South Cornwall. So we don't know where they are or what's happened to them. So although we launched this as a citizen science survey, a lot of the data that I've presented here was collected by actively stalking people on Facebook and searching for jellyfish sightings and seeing what's um, been entered. And so there are lots of problems with this, this sort of data. It gives a really nice overview of where things have been seen and a sort of a feeling for where they are, but it's not very precise. Um, if we use the, the social media, then we have to try to verify it. Um, so we only include um, reports where we have a photograph, a date, and um, I, ideally a little bit more information, but we definitely need a place, a date, and a photograph. We do also include ones that are, are reported by people that are known to be fairly expert, um, but that's unusual. Um, and this data set relies heavily on strandings. Um, and as a result, there's lots we don't know. We don't know how many jellyfish are actually out there. Um, we don't know whether the numbers are changing. We don't know whether climate change will favor jellyfish or a particular species of jellyfish. We haven't seen any invasive ones yet, but they could arrive. And we also don't know whether the ones we see are fulfilling their whole life cycle here because we don't know where the juvenile polyps are. So we are going to keep the citizen science going for us as long as we can. And, and we also have supplemented that with some work on environmental DNA, so testing the water for jellyfish. So I just want to say a big thank to the MBA who provided a small fellowship to Michelle Keenan to do some of that work and the staff at the MBA, PML, um, Amanda, Helen, Rowena, and the staff at University of Plymouth who've been fantastic in supporting Michelle in that work. Um, and if we quickly go to the last slide, um, these are just our ID cards. There are some large ones um, which we found people felt were too big for them to carry around. So we've got the small ones. They're all on our photos on our Facebook page to download. And we have um, a small amount of funding from Sea Changers, a, a great little charity to print these and provide them free of charge to people. Um, and we are planning to share this data with other people. So we have been in touch with Marine Conservation Society, but that was pre-COVID. And we do have to really clean up our data set and make sure it's in a, a really good condition so that we can share it with them with confidence and the data quality. And uh, thank you to Angus for letting me talk about our study. Please give us your sightings. So I'll, I'll hand back to you, Angus. Well, thank you very much, Jeanette. Um, it's a really good compliment uh, to have the Southwest Jellyfish Survey alongside um, things like the, um, the point sampling at the L4 and E1 sites that I'm describing, because the, the time series is a, a nice long time series, but it's not including these large jellyfish and it's only in one place. So I think they, they fit together really, really well. So I'll just carry on a, a bit more about the long time series at the um, L4 site. Um, but before doing that, I just want to describe the seasonality of the site. As Tim said, um, we've got this summer period, um, typically May to September, where the system gets stratified. There's a thermocline and that um, runs the system out of nutrients. Um, and the small supply of nutrients in this um, warm summer stratified period go straight into the plankton. So I'm going to describe two halves of the year, the stratified period and the rest in the um, following slides. 
So this is the um, 30 plus year trend of um, some of the links I've just described in that classical food web. Um, this is provisional data from 2021, but um, for the large copepods, which are strongly dominated by the Calamus helgolandicus, that's the left-hand plot. Um, this is data from Andrea McEvoy and Amanda Beasley. And that shows um, a real step change in this summer stratified period. That's the orange line. The abundance has plummeted um, since about 2012. And that contrasts with the abundance in the rest of the year, which has stayed relatively constant. And that pattern of a steep decline in the summer compared to the rest of the year is mirrored by other taxa, for example, the small copepods, the cladosferans, and the fish larvae. A totally different trend is seen by some of the other groups. Um, this is the mereplankton, that's the pelagic larvae of benthic invertebrates, and another group, the appendicularians. They've increased more in summer than in the rest of the year. So they're almost like replacing the links in the um, classical food web. So the thing that unites these two taxa is that they can feed on very small particles. So I'll get that back to that in a, in a minute. So we just wanted to find out what was happening in this May to August, which is causing this major disruption in the food chain. So we looked immediately at the base of the food web, and this is Malcolm Woodward and Carolyn Harris's nutrient data, and splitting it again into the May to August versus the rest of the year. Um, the rest of the year, the nutrients have stayed fairly high, but in this nutrient limited summer warm stratified period, the availability of the nutrients has dropped quite dramatically. So that is a suggested cause of some sort of disruption in the food chain. So we looked at the next level up for these taxa, which rely on relatively high nutrient concentrations. They're inefficient at getting low nutrients compared to some of the smaller cells with a bigger surface area to volume ratio. So these are the larger phytoplankton that Claire Widdicombe counts with her Lugols counts. So the diatoms, the dinoflagellates, and the larger nanoflagellates that Claire counts have all declined quite dramatically in this productive summer time of the year. These are the small cells that you need a flow cytometer to count. Um, this is Glenn Tarrant's data on the pico and nanoplankton, and that's um, running from 2007 to um, last year. That, these are surface values, and these show that the um, these smaller fraction haven't declined um, like the um, bigger diatoms and dinoflagellates. So we're seeing a major disruption in the food chain that's related possibly to the, some of the size issues. So we had a little bit more of a, a, a detailed look at this sort of body size approach to understanding what's happening at the L4 site. And this is um, using size spectra, which is basically based on the principle that as you go up through the food chain, the animals get um, larger, but the total biomass of those animals gets progressively smaller. And the rate of this attenuation in biomass is a measure of the energy um, efficiency of the food web transfer. So a steeper slope means a lower predator-prey mass ratio or a lower trophic transfer efficiency, either of which mean less energy is flowing up to fish. So we looked at the L4 site in relation to a literature compilation of all available high quality size spectra. So on the y-axis is the slope of these size spectra and on the x-axis is the nutrient input and I've proxied that here by the av um, annual average chlorophyll concentration so this is called a meta-analysis so this is work in progress but basically points in the bottom left of the plot um, for example the north pacific gyre these are the so-called deserts of the ocean which are receiving very little nutrient input they've got a steep slope so it's inefficient energy flow through the planktonic food web. On the opposite extreme, the top right, um, this is a landlocked, um, well, inshore um, lake, uh, sorry, 
it's a it's a lake in northern Germany, which is in agricultural land, um, rich nutrient inputs, and um, very high chlorophyll, and relatively efficient energy transfer through the food web. It all falls somewhere in this um, spectrum. So, what you would expect with climate change, it's um, it's tending in temperate latitudes to increase the degree of stratification, and that is concurrent with an increasing nutrient limitation in summer, so it's pushing them from the top right to the bottom left, so we can measure um, the inefficiency in the energy flow in relation to the um, climatic change. So a good, a rough, um, rough sort of indication, top points in the top right are a relatively efficient energy flow through the food web. Um, and the bottom left, um, not only is there less energy going into the food web, but the trophic transfer efficiency is also dropped. So it's a double issue as you reduce the nutrient input. So to sum up, um, at the L4 site, we seem to have moved away from this sort of um, simple textbook idea of a short, efficient, classical food chain to something that is dominant. Well, the, um, the nutrients are more limited in the summer. That's favoring the smaller cells and the grazers that are, um, can be specialist on eating these smaller cells. So, for example, it's favoring summer increases in mereplankton and these appendicularians that can eat micron sized food particles. So, it's a relatively inefficient energy flow that we're moving towards with the climatic warming. So um, just to sum up, um, 2021 didn't seem to be particularly remarkable for plankton. Um, we're going to compile the, um, all of the observations into the um, annual reports. Um, and the main thing from the time series is that the um, it's sort of like the new normal. It's the continuing of a ongoing trend of um, smaller cell domination of the food chain. And it's still work in progress to try to understand both the causes of it and the implications of it. So that's it. Thank you very much. I'll stop sharing. And that's me done. Thank you very much indeed, Angus. Um, I'm not actually seeing any questions or additional chat. I've got one question pop up now. Um, about iron deficiency, are there measures of iron at L4? Um, not that I'm aware of. Um, I know that um, the group, um, Simon Usher from the um, University of Plymouth, um, was interested in measuring iron at L4, and we certainly would really like to because um, there's an indication that um, not so much that L4, but the offshore site, the E1, could become iron stressed in some years. Um, work um, in the Shelf Sea Biogeochemistry program has shown that even waters um, in the Celtic Sea bec can become iron stressed. It was initially thought that iron stress was a sort of um, something that was only happening in these remote ocean gyres but I think people are finding it's um, becoming a lot closer to home. So it's likely to be a co-limitation of iron and a series of other nutrients. Okay, and, and I'm gonna take the privilege of um, being uh, live to actually ask something about the larvae of spiny lobsters, Palineurus elephas. When people were working on the different stages of uh, development in a larva which stays in the plankton for about 150 days, they seem to have no problem catching them at the Eddystone or round about the Eddystone. Do you ever get uh, phylosoma larvae of uh, Palineurus elephas in your plankton halls? Um, I'll have to um, ask Andrea um, McAvoy, our chief zooplankton analyst um, in particular. I think um, in her observations, um, there was, um, some reports of larvae. Um, so we'll have to go back through them. Andrea's just said only very occasionally. Um, oh, right, but they are they are very occasionally found still, but um, who knows what effort the um, 1950s uh, 
biologists put into catching them, but uh, certainly seems as if they had no problem. So thank you very much indeed for that. I haven't got any more Q&A questions. So I'm going to, uh, unless the uh, presenters have got anything else that they want to um, bring to the uh, audience, the participants' attention, um, I'm going to switch back to um, square, sh square screen, he says, hopefully. I haven't managed to do that. <sighs> Keith, you're just on the welcome slide that we can Yeah, well, see. that's all right. I, I intend to be on the welcome slide, but it hasn't got a green border around it, which it's supposed to have, which is confusing me. So um, thank you very much indeed to all of our speakers and for participants for joining in. Um, what we're doing in Southwest Marine Ecosystems is we're working towards making our presentations and reports into um, basically an estate of the Southwest Seas um, account. Uh, so do keep the section editors informed about your observations on this occasion for 2021. Uh, Bob Earl occasionally sends out a list of the e editors of the different sections with their email addresses so that you can contact them uh, directly. Uh, and, and do think about any conclusions that you might have about what these variations from year to year actually tell us about um, Southwest Seas. Uh, and finally, thank you very much indeed for the Marine Biological Association for hosting this Zoom meeting, providing the platform for it. Uh, and of course, we invite you all to, if you're not already, to join the Marine Biological Association and support our work. So with that, I'll say thank you very much indeed, everyone. And uh, eventually I'll manage to find out how to um, shut this down. So thank you very much indeed, everyone. And we'll leave you now as best we can when I can find the end button. <laughs>